Hello everyone. Today we're continuing our deep dive of Richard Dawkins and Yan Wong's book, The Ancestor's Tale. In this episode, we're going to discuss historical views on the gorilla. So let's jump right in. <laughs> Humans, chimps, and bonobos originated in Africa, and our closest relative, the gorilla, did as well. However, gorillas are the last of the living great apes to have originated in Africa. We'll meet the orangutans in Southeast Asia in the next video. Gorillas are the largest living primates, standing as tall as 1.8 meters, or 5.9 feet, and weighing up to 270 kilograms, or 595 pounds. They're so stocky that, unlike chimps and bonobos, they can't live in trees except as young. There are two species of gorilla, the western and eastern gorillas, for which there are two subspecies of both, and both species, as well as all four subspecies, are critically endangered. They inhabit tropical and subtropical forests in sub-Saharan Africa. Gorillas differ from chimps and bonobos not just in morphology, but also in diet and behavior. Gorillas are vegetarian, and their groups are formed by a dominant silverback male and his harem. Unfortunately, we have no fossil gorillas to go on, as their habitat tends to break down their remains long before they get a chance to get fossilized, a situation similar to that of chimps. Do not despair, however, for there are fossils of orangutan relatives whom we'll meet next time. Therefore, pretty much everything we've learned about gorillas has come from direct observation of them. Interestingly, the views on gorillas and other great apes have changed over time. The earliest potential mention of gorillas comes from the 5th century Carthaginian Admiral Hanno, who sailed down the west coast of Africa. Fun fact, scholars have reason to consider the Hanno story as grounded on some actual observation, because it includes astronomical details that only make sense if they'd cross the equator into the southern hemisphere. Hanno and his men came across an island where a race of large, hairy people lived whom the interpreter called gorillas. Hanno and crew captured three of their women but were unable to transport them, eventually killing and skinning them. Unfortunately, there are problems with this story for modern scientific study. For one, it was recorded in Greek, not Punic, and written down centuries after the alleged events occurred. Hanno might have indeed come across true gorillas, or perhaps even chimps, but given the span of time between the actual events and their recordings, it's also possible these events were highly embellished. We can't hope to know. Actual gorillas were recorded in European literature for the first time in the 1500s when English sailor Andrew Battle was held prisoner by the Portuguese in Angola. He described two human-like monsters named Pongo and Ngeko. And although his account is mixed up with all sorts of misinformation, his description of these so-called monsters matches the gorilla. By the late 1700s, the great apes were confused under the name orangutan, but in 1847, Thomas Savage, an American clergyman and naturalist, formally described the gorilla for the first time, whom he named Troglodytes gorilla. In some papers, the Latin name for the gorilla is ascribed to Savage and another American named Jeffries Wyman, but Wyman only presented Savage's description. Wyman didn't describe the gorilla himself. However, the genera Troglodytes was already given to a wren, so per the rules of zoological nomenclature, the gorilla's name had to be changed. Thus, Isidore Geoffrey Saint-Hilaire gave the gorilla its modern genus, gorilla. Then, as we know, Origin of Species was published in 1859, in which Darwin successfully argued that all of life shared one or a few common ancestors. Darwin didn't want to touch on the human subject then because he knew the scientific and cultural firestorm he was already causing. So he gingerly wrote that, quote, light will be thrown on the origin of man and his history, close quote. It is then a bit silly when people claim that origin is racist because it discusses favored races, a word that was closer to subspecies or variety in Darwin's day. Of course, Darwin saved that hornet nest kick for 1871 with his book, The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex, which Gutsick Gibbon and I discussed previously. See link in the description. 
Though Darwin was reluctant to publish his book, expressing a worry to the evolution skeptic St. George Mivart that he might even get executed as a result, Darwin knew the evidence was abundant and would convince the scientific community, which it did almost immediately. Though not for Mivart, unfortunately, who wrote a book critical of Darwin's ideas in 1871. But Darwin correctly identified that the morphology, embryology, and behavior of the other great apes allied them most closely to humans, and further that all humans share a single common ancestor. An idea that ran counter to the polygynous notions that human races had separate origins, which was a commonly held belief in Darwin's time and was often used to justify slavery. Another scientist of the Victorian era who was vehemently opposed to Darwin's idea of evolution by natural selection was the famous British anatomist Sir Richard Owen. It's ironic because Owen described all the fossils that Darwin brought back from his voyage, and those very fossils helped Darwin formulate his theory. Unfortunately, Owen's religiosity prevented him from seeing what most other naturalists had already concluded, that organisms are indeed related by common descent. Instead, Owen marched down what was ultimately a very bad path by trying to find morphological differences between humans and other apes so that he could argue humans were specially created by God. He argued that only humans possessed certain brain structures found in no other apes, such as the hippocampus minor. However, this turned out not only to be entirely incorrect, but also dishonest as Thomas Henry Huxley decisively showed. That a renowned scientist could employ such underhanded tactics backfired and only helped entrench evolution more. Clearly, opponents of evolution haven't come very far in their tactics since. Today, we know much more about our kinship with gorillas. For example, even as recently as the 1970s, it was widely believed that chimpanzees and gorillas are more closely related to each other than either are to humans. But, as you may already know, this idea was completely overturned due to evidence from genetics which conclusively shows that humans and chimpanzees are each other's closest living relatives and gorillas were the second closest living relative of both. Furthermore, humans and chimps diverged from their last common ancestor surprisingly recently, sometime between 5 to 7 million years ago. A little further back in time, we come to the last common ancestor of humans, chimps, and gorillas, about 8 to 10 million years ago. The clade that is exclusive to these three African ape species is called Homininia, which is most noticeably characterized with a markedly increased tendency towards a terrestrial lifestyle compared to the other apes that are more arboreal, the orangutans and gibbons. While chimpanzees do spend a great deal of time in the trees, when it comes to traveling horizontally, chimps are adept at moving on the ground by knuckle walking similar to gorillas. On the other hand, orangutans are very adept at traveling high up in the forest canopy from tree to tree. While they can move terrestrially, orangutans do so relatively infrequently, and they are rather cumbersome on the ground compared to the African apes. There is another, more peculiar trait that is unique to the African apes. They have a significantly enhanced ability to metabolize ethanol. One important enzyme that is involved in metabolizing ethanol is alcohol dehydrogenase class 4, or ADH4 for short. In 2014, Kerrigan and colleagues published their research in PNAS on the evolution of this enzyme among primates. They reconstructed the ancestral versions of the ADH4 enzyme for various primate lineages and test their catalytic rate on ethanol as the substrate. They identified one amino acid substitution mutation that happened in the lineage leading to African apes, which made the ADH4 enzyme 40 times better at oxidizing ethanol. But why would the ancestors of African apes need to hold their drink at a time long before any alcoholic beverages were brewed? When fruit falls off trees and lands on the forest floor, microbes such as yeast will readily grow inside them and start the process of fermentation, producing ethanol as the waste product. Since African ape ancestors were likely also more terrestrial, they would more frequently encounter fermenting fruit laying on the ground. The ability to metabolize ethanol more easily would mean that an otherwise unappealing food source was more tolerable to them. This would have been especially important in times of food scarcity. This was likely the case for the African ape ancestors since they lived during a cooling period from 15 to 12 million years ago, which led to a wave of extinctions called the Middle Miocene Disruption. A colder and more seasonal climate would mean fruit became more scarce and more restricted during some times of the year, but a higher tolerance to the ethanol in fermenting fruit could have given our shared ancestors with chimps and gorillas 
the edge in survival during these harsh times. So, to summarize, our knowledge of gorillas has come a long way from their early representations as just hairy humans or monsters. Today we recognize that gorillas, like other great apes, are capable of making tools, form long-term social bonds, and are highly intelligent. It's not at all hard to see a bit of ourselves in them when their children play, when mothers cradle their babies, or when an adult carefully crafts a stick for a certain purpose. They are one of our closest relatives and they deserve much more than to be shot for sport or locked up for amusement. So, thanks for watching and I'll see you all next time.